We're having some problems with the calcium carbonate plates getting uh, some cells to some cells to grow. Well, maybe they're not supposed to grow on there. But we made up some extra with uh, with what what would we put in calcium carbonate plates to soup it up? What what might what might one put in if the if the bacteria were a little fastidious? Well, you had yeast extract. All those would be good. Peptone. What would we not want to put in? A carbon source, a carbohydrate. So what, the, what we did, we made up with some treptone and peptone, and I put them in the refrigerator so from Tuesday, so they're, they're still good. If anybody needs them today, let me know after class. It, 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 some of the ones that do plate clearing, they, I mean, well, ours has like about two or three little spots of clearing. That's okay. Yeah, that'd be it. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. right. Another way to do it would be to use a heavier inoculum on the regular calcium carbonate plates. Okay, I want to talk something about the results that are so many of them are due. And the reason that we're, they're due is because we would like to get as much information as possible together by next Tuesday so that you can have that for the tasting on Thursday. Now, I forgot about Monday being a holiday, so it's going to be a little touch and go. But we'll try to get as much as we can. Uh, let, give the information, the results that you have for me today or put them in my box or tomorrow. Now, for the uh, one thing we didn't ask for the results for, until uh, a couple of weeks was uh, experiment number seven. However, you have those results. This is the one with the yeast, yeast uh, strain characterization. You have those results already. You've done the uh, measurements. And so I'm not going to hold you for it, but if you could turn them in, we would have this much information for the tasting too. So I, I'd like you to do that, and then you get it out of the way. You can spend the rest of the time studying. Okay. Um, oh, the distillates. I hope that you, you have those all into me by Tuesday. So Mr. Kroll could run them on Wednesday and we could have those results for Thursday for the tasting. Um, one thing I want to talk about a little bit because there seem to be some problems on the specific growth rate, uh, how to measure this. Now, this is something you really should know already, and, but sometimes we forget and I always have to start from scratch when I think about it too. So I'll go over it rather quickly, not to really discuss it, but if, to give you a little hint if you're having difficulties. Um, if I can remember to do it. The equation for the growth of something that's growing exponentially, this wouldn't count for, say, molds that were growing by, like mycelium, where you have a lot of different dividing uh, points. But for bacteria, things that are dividing by budding or fission, this would be the number of cells of the optical density, the mass, whatever, times the starting material that you had there, the inoculum, and exponentially, this is this kind of equation that describes that growth where K is a specific growth rate, constant, which is constant for the conditions you're using in the organism, and T is the time. Well, this can e we would like to get this in some form of a straight line so we could measure K easily. You can do this on a graph. So you can get a, you can, if you can get a straight line with K as a slope, I'm getting ahead of myself, then you could measure it uh, easily. So we take the natural logarithm, then the natural logarithm of that is just K to the T. We transpose this around here, and you see that's the equation of a straight line. Now, not during the lag periods, or not during the, during the stationary phase, but during where this is in effect, that is the logarithmic growth time. So if you plot then the natural logarithm of x versus time, you'll get some sort of a straight line, and the slope of that would be the growth rate constant. Now, this, it's hard to get logarith natural logarithm paper, and it's, you have to look up all these. So an easier way is to use log paper, log x. And now you have to worry about this being, the slope being divided by 2.3. The slope of this is k divided by 2.3. OK, now if you have more trouble with this, see your neighbor or me after class. Oh, yes? Say, could you quickly go over the derivation of that equation that says g equals 0.7 over k? Oh, if you, about generation time. This is the specific growth rate constant. We're also asked for the generation time. I'll try. If, if we've let this go so that x now is equal to times x, 0, that means that they've doubled once, right? That's the generation time. So generation time means if you had 4 and now you got 8, how long that took? So if we had, if x now equals 2x0, if x equals 2x0, 
then t will equal the generation time. Question? Yeah, how can you say it's divided by 2.3? Okay, we'll come back. To, okay, we'll come back to that. Maybe, maybe it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm on this now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you put this in here, you get uh, 2x0 equals x0 e to the kt. If x0 is not, e is not equal to 0, which will follow up everything, and of course it's not, you can cancel this out. And so 2 equals e to the kt. Take the natural logarithm of both sides, 2, natural logarithm of 2 equals the natural logarithm of this. Of this. Oh, and t is, pardon me, t is going to equal g. So then g will equal the natural logarithm of 2 over k. OK? Is that OK? Everybody agree with that? Yeah, but you can also determine that just from your graph. Yes, you can just look and see where it doubles and give you your g. OK, we had this equation. Logarithm of x equals kt plus natural logarithm of x0. If, see, if you, if you, if you want to determine the natural logarithm, you use the common, log lo common logarithms and multiply times 2.3. So if you want to go the other way, you divide by 2.3. So if we divide everything here by 2.3, we have the common log of x mm -hmm. equals kt over 2.3 plus the common log of x0, which is, but this is the, the intercept if you didn't have a, a lag period, your inoculum. OK, so then our, cur our slope x log x versus time gives you a straight line with this. Is, well, that's, that's the slope. This is a straight line. This is the slope. So the slope, the slope of this equals k over 2.3. Did I have it the other way around? Yeah, so now, in other words, if you're going to convert to the natural log, you multiply by 2.3 times that slope. Like no. No. You take this slope. Well, k then will equal the slope times 2.3, if that's what's confusing you. That is high grade algebra. Ooh, sar <laughs> sarcasm here today. I'm ready for the picnic. But let me, let me point now. How do you measure the slope? It's delta x over delta, delta y over delta x, right? Well, delta x is delta t here. That's easy. But this is not the optical densities, but the logarithm. Logarithm of x2 minus the logarithm of x1. OK, that's enough of that. Okay. Oh, one other thing. You're asked for the, for the lag period for both the growth rate and the fermentation rate. Well, I think under the conditions we've done it, it will be pretty impossible to get the lag period for the growth rate. But now see why this is. We'll draw this curve again without all the accoutrement. To get, uh, if, you ha if, you, uh, if you had all the data from a growth rate, you would have the, the um, inoculum. Now remember, this is the optical density of, of everything, uh, the optical density of your solution after subtracting the grape juice itself which was optical density equal to 1.30. Because you want just the optical density due to the yeast or the bacteria, whatever you're measuring. Well, the lag, one of the ways to measure the lag time here would be draw a line here and a line like this. And this would be the, the lag period. But our inoculum was so small compared to the autoclaved grape juice, it was autoclaved perhaps a little too long, that, and it was so dark in itself, that this, this number here is way down here someplace, unme unmeasurable actually. So it would be pretty difficult to get a lag period. Hope you understand that. OK. So could you measure a lag period by just assume, you know, say, would it intersect with log, log, logarithmic growth is the end of the lag period? There's a beginning, you mean? Uh, oh, yeah, when it enters into a logarithmic growth, yeah, you could do that. That would be a way, yeah. Okay. Jen? Um, Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the whole point. Uh, on getting these results, people said, "Well, can we put do? Can we do them together?" We want the results for two reasons. One is we want to know the results, and the other is you should know how to do it. Yeah. You won't have to bring graph paper. We'll provide it. <laughs> yes, you can bring a logbook if you feel better, or a slide rule with it on it. Yeah. Okay. Now. 
One more, two more slight announcements. Jeez. One is next Thursday, um, there's a special function for Dr. Amarine in the evening, in which I'd like to go to. And we're going to have our tasting. Would any people in the afternoon section, evening section, mind if we started at 6 rather than 7? For what day? Yeah. That's a week from today. Would that be bad? At 6. Okay. How about 5? 5 to 7. Okay. Well, you wouldn't, would, you be, would you like to come in the afternoon section? Okay, outside of, outside of Debbie, is there anybody that would mind coming at 6 rather than 7? Oh. Are you at 530? <laughs> is it tasting at 5? Yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll go to 6. We'll go to 6. Will it, will it cut into it? No, go to 6. Well, if we... It can be over at 6. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, if that causes a problem, we can announce it later on Tuesday, but let me know if that causes a, another problem. Oh, the other thing, I've got some kickback from some, some of the graduate students upstairs. There was, somebody's going to write a poem about graduate students one of these days. But they thought that maybe people from this class weren't uh, leaving the lab as clean and as neat as they... So today we want to start talking about uh, micro microbiological stability. Especially I'm thinking about semi-dry wines. Now, I've had a handout on, uh, on chemical stabilization, and we'll talk about that later as much as we need to, but I want to talk today about physical methods, if I can have the floor. <laughs> um, and first of all, I think it might, it might point out, get a little personal here, that this is uh, something that I'm, kind of I'm kind of on a soapbox about. By the way, if you came to my seminar the other day, you've heard this whole thing already. <laughs> but it'll be a little, little, expan a little more expanded, I hope. But I really feel that this is uh, an opportunity for microbiologists, finally, to have a say in the California wine industry about how they should go about uh, bottling semi-dry wines. Now, I have to go back further than that. Once upon a time, I didn't think it was such a hot idea to make semi-dry wines. I can remember somebody calling me up and saying, what kind of yeast should you use that would be alcohol sensitive enough that you could ferment, wouldn't necessarily ferment to dryness, and so you could bottle this wine? And before answering his, his, question, his or her question, I won't say who it was, I said, well, uh, why bother? Why, why do you want to do, make semi-dry wines? Solve your problem by, by selling only dry wines. But, Times have changed, and I've changed. Um, and it's not from Pagan Pink that uh, did it either. It's from just that I've gotten to enjoy these kinds of wines very much, uh, not only uh, California ones, but European ones. Now, by the way, what's wrong with the suggestion or the uh, question that was asked me about using a yeast, a special yeast for this? Why would that not be a way to, to get stable wine, semi-dry wine, mellow wine? because other uh, yeast could ferment it. Right, that's right. You, you're not so solving any problems at all. You're just delaying them. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's, so my, okay. Then we, there, we could talk about, um, if we're going to, if we've decided to make semi-dry wines, we could talk about uh, uh, ways to do it. And I want to suggest today that one of the best ways would be not to use chemicals, but to use, um, use some physical method. Now, uh, I have to tell, get personal again, too, because at one time I thought chemicals would be a, a very good way, and I say now that if we had a perfect chemical, if DEPC were, were perfect, or maybe, even if, maybe it still is perfect, or DMPC uh, comes through, this would seem to be, not, I mean, I can't see anything wrong with it if you're going to have a perfect chemical. That is a chemical that does its job and goes away and it has no uh, bad effects, and it's not too expensive, and it's easy to get into a solution, and <laughs> all this sort of thing. But the one, the one danger of this is that you get to fool yourself and think every, you have the giddy idea that all is well. This is, I kind of hinted on this about talk, when we talked about using fermeric acid to inhibit malolactic fermentation, that if you depend upon a chemical, and then the next day you found that the, you can't use it, then you're really in in trouble, serious trouble. Now fortunately, when DEPC went out, I say fortunately qualified, we had sorbic acid. But now, it seems two years, three years later, uh, we ought to have, there ought to be something better than sorbic acid. And we can talk about the problems with sorbic acid. And well, you know, it's the taste is the problem, I think. And I think it's uh, outrageous to depend upon this when there are other ways to do it. And that, uh, that brings up the practicality 
Uh, the things we want to talk about, I think, are the alternatives and the uh, of using uh, alternatives to cold bottling, our physical uh, stability, uh, the advantages of it. Advantages. Um, the practicality and the disadvantages. And then when we talk, finish these, I have some slides to kind of, we'll talk about the, the unit process, what you do to do this, and I have some slides that I hope will illustrate it a little bit. Well, I think the, the advantages, we're, we're talking about the advantages now, and I think the biggest thing is that you don't have to worry about uh, having the, uh, relying on some chemical, which, which later on might be, uh, for some reason or other, might be made uh, illegal or hard to get, or, or um, not appropriate for one reason or another. Um, some of the alternatives we, that we could have would be the chemical ones that we are going to talk about later, but also we could talk about something besides um, s filtering and using sterile equipment. I guess I should say that what I wanted, the thing I'm talking about now is filtering the wine and then bottling it from the, keeping the wine sterile from the filter to the bottle. There are other ways you might be able to do this besides chemical, and one of them, of course, is heat. Now, one way would be to hot bottle. Now, this, this will solve your problem, but it brings other problems. And that is, I think most people agree that hot bottling uh, gives you some deterioration of the wine. I don't want to um, be hard-nosed about this. I have heard some rumors that there are some things in the wind that make this hot bottling picture a little more attractive than it was previously. Some people in England have been doing, I haven't tasted these wines, unfortunately. Some people in England have been doing hot bottling where there are two things they're watching out for, three things. One is that they're, be sure the wine has a real low redox potential in the first place, no oxygen in there. Secondly, they're making sure that their heat exchanger that's heating the wine has good bypass equipment so you're not overheating the wine any time. Any time the line stops, you're really certainly bypassing the, uh, um, the, the heat exchanger. And the third thing is that the heat exchanger is set at a real minimal temperature to kill all the organisms, or that the wine at that temperature in the bottle will be hot enough to kill all the organisms. Uh, I've talked to wine people, that winemakers or bottling line people that say often what happens is that he, there's some recommended figure that you should have for the, the hot bottling, and then somebody else comes along and sets that up a, a, a degree or two just to make sure it doesn't, um, nothing grows, and somebody else comes along and sets it up another couple of degrees, and pretty soon you're five degrees hotter than you need to be, and this is the point where you're getting some deterioration. We might talk about uh, high temperature, short time uh, ways of, of uh, pasteurizing wine instead of filtration. Now this could be good, perhaps, and I also have heard that there are ways of doing this at I mean, very high temperatures, a very short time, that don't do much damage to the wine. It doesn't do much damage to the wine. But you still have the problem from the heat exchanger to the bottling line. That's not what we're talking about now. We're talking about trying to keep st sterile wine or wine without yeast under that condition until it gets into the bottle. All right, a little bit about the practicality. I think that's the, most people are afraid of this and wonder, is it really true? Can you really do it? Well, you really can. Uh, it's been done in Europe for the last uh, 15 years or so with uh, very good success. Uh, they didn't allow DEPC until many, until just a few years ago. As a matter of fact, it was only being used maybe about a year, I think, before it was uh, disallowed, made illegal. And, and then when it was made illegal, uh, they had sorbic acid, and some people are using sorbic acid, some people are using hot bottling, but most of it, I would say, is done by cold sterile bottling uh, techniques. Yeah, John. I wonder about, you know, if you were to casually ask someone uh, how well, you know, how much success they're having on mm -hmm. a practical level, if they tell you that they have a 
cases? Well, um, the people I've asked that had no reason to, I can't imagine any reason to tell me anything else. They weren't selling any equipment or anything like that. And nobody has ever had any trouble that I talked to. In Europe. Pardon me? With what? With uh, uh, getting secondary fermentation of, from, of uh, yeast growth in the bottle after they after it left the, the winery. Yeah, with, with oh, of uh, using the method I'm talking about, uh, cold sterile bottling. With, um, I'm saying um, sterile. By sterile, I mean aseptic, no yeast. We're not talking about bacteria. This is another situation that is also feasible, I think, to prevent malolactic fermentation, but it's a whole other ball game and requires much, much tighter pads and much um, more difficult uh, uh, flow-through uh, problems of uh, time for clogging up, I should say. Yeah, silting problems. Are you restricting this discussion to semi-sweet wines? Yes. Okay, a good point. Not, we don't need to talk about this as far as dry wines are concerned because there's no problem there. It's only when they have some residual sugar. By the way, it's a very interesting point that it doesn't take very much. We think of a dry wine as being, say, one-tenth to two-tenths percent um, reducing sugar. When well, these, generally speaking, not being hexoses, these probably are pentoses, which yeast can't use. But just go up one more and you can get a haze. What, if, if, you, if you dry one with this, then 0.2 can do it. If your dry one was 0.2, then 0.3 percent reducing sugar can give you a haze. So we're talking about very low sugars. Has anybody ever done a study like just the alcohol rising a whole bunch of wines in the 0.1 to 0.2 range and seeing if these were growing? If, if the yeast would utilize the dry Oh, a dry one you mean? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I'm sure it's been done. I'm sure it's been done. Yeah, because I've never done it myself. I haven't, don't remember seeing the data. But. Taste? Taste? Mm -mm. I, a lot to, it depends on alcohol and, and, uh, and acidity. But of course, the, the, the wines I'm talking about really are much more than this, uh, 0.5 to uh, 1%. But well, we're talking about practicality. Uh, one of the things is, what do you, as we'll say, what do you need as far as equipment goes? Do you have to... Can you afford to do this? Can, can you afford to do this? Do you, can you afford to buy the new equipment for the new bottling line? Well, it's really hard to come by uh, data exactly how much things cost and the price keeps going up. And I, if we were in a static situation where we weren't doing any expansion, where wineries weren't doing any expansions, I'm not sure whether it would be uh, a very, I think it would tend to be a rather expensive pro uh, process to put in this equipment. The capital investment would be rather high, I think. But I think in an expanding economy where you're, where you're putting in new lines and new wineries anyway, I think it's rather stupid not to uh, put in the kinds of equipment that can be sterilized so that you, in order to do this kind of operation. There is another problem, though. This, these kinds of equipment often are, are scarce and you have to order them. The delay may be six months to a year. That's, another, that's one of the practical aspects of this the impractical aspects of it, I should say. Well, what are the disadvantages? I think the disadvantage is that the winemaker thinks he'll never get a good night's sleep the rest of his life because he's worried about, is this wine going to carry out a secondary fermentation or not? He, uh, you need some things. One is you need some sort of method to check the wine to make sure everything is going well, that you aren't getting contamination. And we, there, there is a standard method, which we'll talk about uh, today, I hope, where you can uh, de you can uh, assay for this, but it takes about three days. So this means that the wine you can't sell. If the wine's already sold, you don't want to send it out of the warehouse uh, until you've checked this. But even if you even if you've made arrangements or you're not in such a hurry to to get the wine out of the warehouse, you still have the problem. If something went wrong, you've got the problem of dumping all that wine. The wine has been corked or stoppered. It all has to be. Um, uncorked hand labor taken out of the taken out of the cases and put back into tanks and treated again and the wine's never going to be as nice as it was before. So um, there is this disadvantage that if something did go wrong. So what one really needs is a quick method to tell whether everything is going right. And there are two things you can do. One is if you're using a membrane filtration, you can do the bubble test, where this is. Uh, uh, specific for the type of uh, membrane that you have, you introduce an uh, air bubble on the, 
on the entering side of the filter. And now you see how much pressure it takes to get that air bubble on the other side of the filter. Now this doesn't work for depth filters, but it works for membrane type filters where you have discrete pore sizes. And that uh, requires a certain amount of pressure to get that bubble through. Now if the hole is bigger than that, if, there, if, it was, if the membrane isn't seated well, or there's been a rupture in the membrane, or it's defective, then that bubble will go through faster. So you look and see and see how much pressure it takes to get that bubble through, and if it does at that time, then you're sure that the membrane is okay, that the filtration is all right. So that's one kind of control you have. The other is there is a quick method which uh, we've worked on, and I'll show you about that uh, hopefully today, and we'll do that, show you that better in the lab on Tuesday, on a way that within a half an hour, you can see if there's any uh, yeast getting into the bottle. Remember that if something's wrong, it's going to be terribly wrong. You're going to have lots of yeast, so it's not going to be so difficult. You're not looking for the difference between uh, three yeasts in a bottle and none. Something like You're looking for something wrong. There'll be thousands of yeasts in the bottle. Not enough to, to begin the turbidity, but enough that you can detect them other ways. Um, another thing that most people, I think, are afraid that you have to have a really hospital-clean situation, that you have to have... Uh, filtered air into some enclosed room that everybody has to wear a surgical mask and go through uh, phenol showers or something like this. This, isn't, this is not true. Uh, you do have to take precautions. We'll talk about this in a minute when I show the slides you. It is good to have a room that you have the bottling equipment and the corking or stoppering equipment in. But this, the separate room, uh, the main purpose of this room though is not to keep yeasts out, but to keep people out that this room, well, only people that can go in there are people that are sensitive to what's going on, to knowing that this is a very, uh, that it is a delicate operation, but a, not too delicate if it's handled right. But if you just had people going in and out that either visitors or people on the line that didn't realize what was going on, you could get con contamination pretty easily. Also, it prevents some aerosols of yeast that might be in the winery, especially if you're not too far away from the fermentation rooms, of, of uh, yeast cross currents of yeast. But this room does not have to have uh, positive pressure, does not have to have sterile air entered into it. It, does, it has to be clean, but it doesn't have to be uh, hospital clean, as we'll see uh, some of the situations that, uh, we're not, or that we're far from hospital clean. Well, I think the thing to talk now about is what do you need for this, for this operation. First of all, you need, you need uh, well, sterile wine we have. I think that's our uh, wine with no yeast. I think that's easy. Californians know how to do this very well, with, especially with membrane filtration. You can also do it with depth filtration. Now, there's going to be a whole change. There is a whole change in this scene now because of removal of asbestos filters. I mean that people aren't using asbestos filters anymore. So this makes the situation a little bit different, and we don't have a lot of data on how this is going now. Uh, a lot of cellulose depth filters are being used, which I've heard anywhere from, they have anywhere from 90 to 50 percent the flow through that the asbestos filters had. But at any rate, this is the, you need this to clean up the wine to make it brilliant before you get to the membrane itself. Yeah, but, 50 to 90% of the efficiency, Yeah, I think that part's okay. It's just the throughput before they clog up or... Yes, I think so. Uh -huh. Again, I haven't seen exhaustive data on this. It's all rather new. Yeah. Uh, having, a, having a cellulose depth filler. That could, be, that could be glad for that information. I hadn't heard that. Okay. Well, okay, there may be problems there, uh, not insurmountable, but maybe that uh, silting is a lo little bit worse nowadays because we don't have the asbestos pads or aren't using the asbestos pads. That people are, st are still bottling uh, uh, wine without yeast, uh, sterile, using sterile bottling. Well, so we have the wine. Now the next thing we have to talk, first thing we have to talk about are the bottles themselves. Now strictly speaking, bottles are, are free from yeast. They come in, they are free from any organisms. They come off, you know, very hot, put into uh, cart cartons, and then transported and used nowadays uh, within 
a day or hours usually from the time they get to the winery. This doesn't mean that they're clean though. They a lot of times have dust in them, but this dust is usually, uh, or doesn't necessarily have any yeast in them. But people want to get rid of the dust. And so getting rid of the dust, often you can contaminate the bottles. Um, this could be changed, I think. In, in Germany, where I've got a lot of this information, they do have shrink wrap new bottles that are often used directly, right out of the, the big cartons. And the, the, what happens is the bottles come off of the line. Instead of, instead of being put in cardboard, a plastic sheet is put over the top, and then cardboard is put on, and then plastic is put over the whole thing, and this is what they call shrink wrapped. It's, it's hot plastic, and as it cools, it shrinks down. Now, I think the big problem then would be to sell the idea to the bottle manufacturers in California, but I know that, uh, from what I've heard, that these are pretty, it's not so easy to do that always, to get them to come to the spe specifications that you want, probably for, for good reasons. Well, one thing would be to perhaps take the chance of these new bottles and, and not to worry about the dirt that's in them, but I don't think that's a very good answer. One way would be then to blow them out with sterile air. Now, sterile air is not too difficult. You can use uh, filter pads, and you don't have to have the very tight porosity that you do for liquid, for say for wine, because the electrostatic attraction, you can get by, say with membranes of eight microns to take out yeast and bacteria. So it's, it, it is somewhat expensive to, uh, fil to sterile filter air, but not outrageously so. Probably the best thing, though, would be to have a bottle sterilizer. And there are all kinds of these, uh, most of them involving uh, sulfur dioxide. By the way, I'm I want to talk today about not just about one size winery. I want, to, I want to, to imply that I'm talking about large scale wineries, middle sized wineries, and very small wineries, hand operated uh, uh, bottling equipment. All of this is, uh, all these kinds of equipment is available for all levels of uh, sizes of wineries. The two kinds of bottle bottle sterilizers that I know of. One is where you're using dry SO2 that the bottle, it looks like a, a filling machine. The bottle goes into this uh, filler and uh, SO2 gas is put into the bottle and halfway through then it's blown out with sterile air and then it goes up and has to be scrubbed some way in the fluid not to go out into the air of course. Now this is coming down with dry bottles and one wonders well how is it that a dry bottle, how can you kill uh, yeast with uh, SO2 when they're dry, and they, apparently you can, and the rationale seems to be that if the yeast are viable, they're slightly moist, and they can pick up the SO2 that way. The, another way is to, this is a, a small operation, is to have the bottles inverted over a spigot that shoots in SO2 water into the bottle, and then lets it drain, and then shoots sterile water in to rinse it out. There's a little residual SO2 in this case, that figure about three parts per million in the bottle, then, and you have to take this into account when you're figuring out how much SO2 to add to your wine. Now, about three, yeah. What concentration of SO2 do you I think it's 1% for that, I think. I'm pretty sure that's right. Now, there's another treatment you want to do to the bottles either before or after, or I should say before the bottle sterilization and before the filling, too. The, the best place to get contamination now now you have your bottle. You got this all sterile inside, but whatever you're doing, you're not, you're not, it's not very easy to sterilize the top of the rim here because you've put that up into the filling machine. So before you do that, you can have a series of gas jets that will flame the top of the bottle. So the idea then would have the bottles come in on the line, come in through a port into this bottling room, hit a, have a flame hit the top, that will uh, sterilize the top. Now you have to have fail-safe uh, things here that if the bottling line jams and stops, you, don't, you want the, the flame to go off because you don't want to get this bottle that hot. Then you, so you sterilize the top of this bottle, then you go into the bottle sterilizer, and then come out, and now it's ready to go into the filling machine. But you also, another good thing to have is a canopy, a stainless steel canopy over the bottles after they have hit the bottle sterilizer so that nothing will drop into them to contaminate them. Then you go to the filling machine. The filling machine, the only requirements of the filling machine are, are the basic requirement is that you're able to sterilize it ahead of time, that you're able to, to get all the nooks and crannies uh, free from yeast. And that's 
I think the, the bottling machines that do this are ones that don't have a lot of nooks and crannies, that they uh, have uh, seams and no, and no places where you have lots of, uh, where you have threads or, or places where you could get um, uh, wine, dried wine to sit there and get uh, contamin uh, yeast growth. Also, in all this equipment, you want valves uh, or gauges that are specially prepared that have uh, stainless steel membranes rather than rubber membranes so that you'll have it can be clean, uh, sterilized, and you won't have places where yeast can grow. So the bottling machine must be able to be sterilized ahead of time, and you usually do this uh, a couple hours, an hour ahead of time with very hot water, say, uh, say uh, in Fahrenheit, 180 degrees, or with steam. Now, it's a tradi tradition that wine people have ordinarily used hot water and beer people have used steam, but I think that's changing. I think uh, wine people are using steam a lot now. You had a question? Okay. Yeah. Another two requirements for the filling machine is one is if it's the type that returns the wine back to a bowl. You can see this would be a source of contaminating the rest of the wines if you got a bottle in there that was dirty. So what you want to make sure is that return bowl is very small so that you will wash out um, any contaminant there very quickly so it will go in the next one or two bottles. And then you go. No, then it comes out of the bottling machine, and again under a canopy to the let's say to a corker. Um, now, the we can buy the. Let's talk about corks now. Corks have been a problem, but that's apparently a solved now too. We can buy sterile corks, and these are usually ones that have been put into that have been uh, say waxed, tumbled in uh, with paraffin. And I know some people are doing this themselves with old. Uh, dryers, these uh, commercial dryers that they have in the uh, laundromats, and tumbling uh, corks with paraffin and then putting them in plastic and uh, giving them uh, shots of SO2 gas, sealing them up. Now you want your hopper where you put the, the corks to be sterile, put the corks in, and then have it run down into the holder, and the, here's a place where, where, you, where you possibly can get contamination. If you get wine um, spilling onto the holder there that's holding the cork, then that's a good place for yeast to grow. So this is solved by a couple of ways. Uh, on a large scale operation, you can have flames on this holder to keep it hot, or electric elements in there to keep it hot, or for smaller operation, you can just add SO2 water to it uh, from time to time to make sure you washed all that off. This comes to another thing we have to talk about, the filling machine. You want to make sure, and this is, with modern machines, this is no problem, but you want to make sure the cork always leave, that the filling machine doesn't bring the wine up so far that when the cork goes down in there, you're going to spill some wine out. You want that level of wine always to be somewhat below where the cork comes in. Because otherwise you get wine, sweet wine out onto the corking machine and a good source of contamination. Uh, you just said that there's two dangers, of, uh, two other dangers about wine. And one was that there was a small return bowl. And what was the other one? Or this is it. Yeah. So the requirements for the filling machine were really are three. One, that you can sterilize it easily. The other is that it has a small return bowl, if it has a return bowl. And the third is that it gives uh, the desired level in all the bottles of wine. Now, I don't know about s using stoppers rather than uh, or caps rather than, than uh, corks. I could imagine that would be a lot easier, but I don't know any situation where they're actually using that. So once you've got the, the wine cork, then it goes out the room and into the labeling machine, the labeler. Now you shouldn't have the labeler and all this other paraphernalia in this same room. There's lots of uh, things batting around and it does, it's not necessary to be in there and I think it causes lots of uh, cross currents too. Well, I think um, I'll, I'll um, we can show the slides on the, some of the bottling lines I've seen, but I also have slides on the, the method of detecting viable yeast after you've taken the bottles off the line, the quick method and the old method. But I'll save those, that part, I think, till, till Tuesday. But we can talk now about the, uh, some of the lines that I've seen. Huh? Yeah, well, the, this, this isn't the bubble, this won't have the bubble test in it. <laughs> yeah, because the ones I'm going to talk about were not we're filtering with uh, depth filters rather than uh, um, membrane filters. Um, well, I guess, um, hey, uh, Barney, could you uh, handle that up there? Sure. Yeah, turn it on. And you know, okay. um, yeah, leave that on. I'm looking for a pointer, yeah.
You don't have one, but I never remember to bring it with me. That's funny. Oh. Well, this, this is, I'll get back here. Oh, thanks. Uh, this is some of the shrink-wrapped uh, bottles I was, was telling you about here. They would be, like this one has three, three layers. Yeah, three layers. And here's, they're on fork, on pallets for forklifts. Um, by the way, this is, this was the place where they they do a lot of, um, they do a lot of uh, recycling of glass in Europe, especially in Germany. And so they, they have to have, in addition to all this stuff, they have to have a bottle, bottle washers to remove the labels and clean them out, and then before they even go into the bottle sterilizer. Well, that's another thing. In the bottle sterilizer, sometimes we'll be using uh, wash, fresh wash bottles, and they'll be wet. And again, there'll be pickup of the SO2 in those bottles, so you have to take that into account. When you're using the dry SO2 into these bottles that have come out of a bottle washer, in the, in the uh, sterilizing machine. All right, Ronnie, can I have the next slide? You have to just barely tap it. Just, just a little, no, no, just, not such a heavy hand. No, just, just, just with your finger. No, just, there, the close up of these uh, shrink wrapped uh, bottles. Next one. Can you handle it? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's just another one. There might be some extras in here. Okay. Can I have a, uh, oh, this shows how some, this is beer, I think. But uh, this is show how some places that they do this all automated with a pneumatic um, lifter here, picking up this off this whole pallet here and putting it onto the line. Would that be a source of contamination, though? No, because this thing is all steril, sterilized ahead of time. Although lots of places, some places went, used the bottles uh, right out of there, and some places they did a sterilization too. Um, this uh, is a bottling line. Um, can you screw that uh, lens so we can get the whole thing onto here? No, the outside, the edge. Oh, thank you. There we go. Thanks. Yeah, this is the bo this is the bottling line. And the, the sterile room that we're going to be talking about is back in here with gla glass walls. This is a rather large uh, winery um, uh, co-op in uh, Germany. And so the bottles have come out and they do all the labeling and the, and the um, capsule putting on outside. Okay, next uh, slide. Okay, here's the sterile room from the outside. See the bottles are coming out through this port and the door getting in is over here. And I always get a laugh when I say <laughs> that you don't have to be too too sensitive, to, you don't have to be too clean and too hospital clean that this isn't a surgeon and it's not Louis Pasteur here, either one. He, but this, but he doesn't look so uh, like he knows what he's doing, but he does and he keeps most people out. Uh, let me in, he was a nice guy. Uh, just a quick look what's happening here. This is, back here is a bottle sterilizer, bottle filler, and then the corking machine. And the, and the bottles are coming in from here and we'll see the next picture from the other side. Okay, next picture. Next slide. Okay, here are the bottles coming out. And I think this case, yeah, this case, they've come right off the pallet and are going in through this port into the room. Next slide. And here they've come into the port, and here are the flame, jet flames, flaming the top. Next. Okay, coming. Here's the jet flames. They're coming in here to the, this is the bottle sterilizer. It looks just like a bottle filler. I think probably coming in here, yeah, and going around, halfway around getting SO2, halfway, other halfway around getting uh, sterile air, and now coming here under this canopy and then into the filling machine. Next. Uh, yeah, that's the same, kind of the same view. Here's the filling machine again. Taken two different times with two different cameras. One good and one bad. Okay, they're coming out of the bottling machine, down here under a canopy to the corker. And then out from after corked out through that port where we started. Next, uh, yeah. Do you recall what kind of investment that bottle sterilizer? They're about the same price as the bottler, and those large ones are about a hundred thousand dollars. So that's something you have to think about. That does add one extra thing to your line, but that's not so much when you think how much you're putting in your line. 
All right, here is just uh, showing the filter for filtering the wine. And uh, there's a heat exchanger, yes, uh, bringing the wine up to, a little, it's been in the cellar, uh, bringing it up to a little warmer temperature. You understand, this wine now, it was dry wine to which the sweet reserve had been added maybe uh, a week before. They liked what they could say, let it marry first before they uh, bottle it. Um, this is in um, uh, Gau Augelsheim at the uh, big co-op there in, in, in Rheinhessen. Uh, next. Uh, yeah, I think so. It's easier for labeling. I think that's the purpose of it. Yeah. And here's the SO2 going into the to the bottle sterilizer. And again, you have to have fail-safe equipment. That this is the flow meter, but if this runs out, then this drops down and shuts off the line. And here's just a simple uh, air filter for sterilizing the air that goes in washing the, uh, or swishing the uh, SO2 out. Did they use nitrogen storage in their bottles? Let me see. Um, I don't think so, but I maybe, maybe some places they did. I, I'm not, I, I didn't, I don't know. Yeah, here's your answer, I don't, I don't know. Um, next time. It could be done the same, handled the same way of filtering the nitrogen. But I know lots of places they did not. They did air. Well, this isn't a very good picture, but I want, wanted to show what a, what, a mem what a membrane, this is actually a millipore membrane setup looks like where you put the, it's like plate and frame, and there's other kinds that are cartridges. Um, by the way, I have no vested interest in millipore or nucleopore or zeitz or any of these uh, companies, but I try to give the information that they've given to me. Okay, the next slide. Oh, here's to show kind of the kind of clamps that you want, the kind of um, connections that you want for all this equipment. That's, that's the flange uh, qu uh, connections rather than threaded, so this can be easily sterilized with the hot water steam. Next slide. We're doing on time. Ooh, yeah. Oh, this is showing this is a smaller plant and got there in time to see the sterilization that they were doing maybe an hour ahead of time before they started their uh, run. And this is, uh, they use steam here, as you can see, steaming the filter. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. Um, they're steaming the uh, bottling machine. Next slide. Here, now these were, they were using used bottles coming out of the bottle washer and then going in here, then into the bottle sterilizer. Next. Do you ever have any problems with uh, bad sizes from one lot to the next? Uh, oh yeah, I think they I think they hand sort them. Oh, I see what you mean. No, I mean like yeah. all of a sudden there's one lot of bottles yeah. be a quarter of an inch taller and your machine starts taking yeah. the neck off. Um I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh I kind of think that they're pretty standard because they are doing so much uh, recycling. Next slide. Okay, here we're going down the the line, oh, in this case, they're joining used bottles with new bottles, and they're going to do a uh, sterilization of both of them. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Keeping you a little bit, but much long. Now here, again, this is just the, the bottles going into, this is another place, going into the bottle sterilizer, coming out under the canopy, then into the uh, filler. Next slide. Again, another picture of it going into the filling machine, coming out, then over the cork. Next place. Next. Now this, notice that, that those ones I was just showing you, they didn't have a special room. That was just the same room that everything was going on there. It was uh, not a big winery, but um, that's a joke about this. I'll, I'll save that joke for later. Uh, but remember that. But anyhow, they, they didn't have a special room. Now here's a smaller operation where they were doing, uh, um, what was this, uh, a thousand bottles uh, an hour, I think. Can that be right? Yeah. And, and uh, they have several people working here, but it's not a, it's not a, a line. It's all uh, done by hand. Now this is, this is the overall thing, and we'll show some of the smaller parts one little by little. Here is the, I mean separately, the, here is the bottle sterilizers. And this is, after they come out of there, they put into this container that has hot water in the bottom to keep, the next, keep them sterile until they're ready for use. They come out of there onto this filler, filling machine, and when it's full, uh, this man takes one out and puts the cork in. Okay, uh, next slide. Show some parts of this. This 
I thought when I took this picture that this was the steamer they were using and this was the filling machine. Actually, this is a new steamer and they hadn't set it up yet, much bigger than the one they were using, which I don't really have a picture of. Uh, next, next slide. But the point is you can buy steaming equipment. Now here's this, uh, the bottle sterilizer. The bottles are upside down on a spigot and the, CO2, the SO2 is being washed up in there. Um, and here's the filter. This is the filter for the water rinse here. Next slide. Yeah, there's a better picture of it. I think you can see. You can't really see the spigots, but it goes, thing goes around. It comes in, you can hear it sprays. The water rinses, and he takes it out and puts it in that other thing. Next, and here's the, the, wa the water filter. Next slide. Almost done. Oh, that, that spigot then holds some SO2 water. So that has to drain out before you run the water rinse in, and that's draining out, and they're just collecting it here, not only to use it again, but to keep it from, from going down the drain. So you can see the guy taking him out there, put him in here. Next one. Under the filling machine, taking one off. This is an old barn and looked like it and kind of smelled like it too. So it's just showing that what you can get away with. And the man said he had started this, taking it over from his father four years ago. And, and again, he said he had never had a bottle uh, returned. Next, for that reason. <laughs> Next slide. Um, <laughs> here's taking them off here. This is the, the filter that they were using. And for steaming purposes, I think in the next slide, I think I can show that one better. Yeah, you see that for steaming purposes, the steam comes in to the filter this way and over to the bottling machine that way. And this is just some SO2 water that the, that the cork, man doing the corking uh, poured onto the lock, the holder, every once in a while. Uh, next slide. Uh, pump. Next slide. Uh, yeah, here is the corking machine. So he's, he's using sterile corks and clean that out and every once in a while pours SO2 water on that. Next slide. Okay, so how the lights? So we'll see you this afternoon. <laughs> I mean at Woodland and next uh, Tuesday. And any, and whatever results you can get to me before next Tuesday will be a help to us all. Thank you.